Friends, Dr. Travis has read the scripture of the sermon into your hearing. So let us look particularly at the thesis verse, underline these words from the 25th verse in your Bibles. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. Brothers and sisters, with the help of your prayers and under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, we would like to preach to you this morning on the subject of how many times do I have to prove it? How many times do I have to prove it? Providence Missionary Baptist Church and guests, we are preaching this morning from the story of Thomas. The very familiar story of Thomas one week after the resurrection. And I am reminded that the story of Thomas is actually the story of all of us. Here in the story of Thomas, Good Friday has passed. Jesus did indeed die on the cross that we all might live. Thomas was there, scripture says, to see his Lord die, but he was unwilling to stay as he scattered with the remainder of the male disciples. Indeed, Holy Saturday has passed. At this point, despair, fear, and trepidation has fallen among all who were followers of Jesus. Everything they thought was going to occur in their minds now was not going to occur. And by the time we get to our text, also Resurrection Sunday morning has passed. On Easter Sunday morning, if you recall from last week's message, the male disciples were not at the tomb. Thomas was not there. Jesus, after lifting up out of the tomb, we believe by faith he knew his disciples. He knew some other followers that he had. He knew they would need more proof if they were going to carry the gospel. He knew they would need more evidence if they were going to build the church. So history tells us that for 40 days after the resurrection, he stayed on earth before his ascension to heaven. John 19 says that on the evening of the first day of the week, in the evening, resurrection Sunday morning has already occurred that morning. Now we are on the evening, on Sunday evening after the tomb was found empty, on Sunday evening after they had not gone to the tomb, on Sunday evening after the women had gone to embalm a dead hero. It's now Sunday evening. All the disciples are together in a house. The door is locked. They don't know what's going on. They have heard from the women that Jesus is risen. They've gone to the tomb and seen that his body is gone. But you can imagine Sunday evening, no one knows what's going on. They're all together in the house. And the Bible says on Sunday evening, Jesus came and stood among them in the house where they were meeting. He came and stood right among them. This is interesting. They did not believe enough to stand with him at the cross, yet he loved them enough to stand with them Sunday evening. They did not believe enough to go to the tomb for his coronation, yet he stood with them Sunday evening. They probably didn't even believe enough when the women came back and told them that the tomb was empty, yet he came and stood with them. This is such a powerful verse in Scripture. Do you know that your strong faith is not required for Jesus to stand with you? You getting it all right, you understanding it perfectly, you always walking with the Lord. That is not a prerequisite in our faith. The Lord is willing to stand with you in the midst of your disbelief. The Lord is willing to stand with you in the midst of your mistrust. The Lord is willing to stand with you in the midst of your doubts. There they are. Sunday evening. They saw him die, but now... He stood, he stood among them. The Bible says when the disciples saw him, they worshiped him, they honored him, they believed. And in that moment, because they were present in the house on Sunday evening, the text says Jesus breathed upon them, transferring the spirit that was in him 
to now the Holy Spirit that would be in them. They received the Holy Spirit, but there's an interesting footnote in this story. All the disciples were present except Thomas. Everybody was in the room to receive Jesus on Sunday evening except Thomas. Where was Thomas? We had found out earlier that morning that the tomb was empty. Where was Thomas? The women had come back to us and shared with us what the angels had said, that the Lord had risen, that everything he taught us was true. We remembered this. We were all together. They probably were praying and talking about what was going to happen. They were nervous. Fear and trepidation was upon them because when you don't know what's coming, fear is upon you. They were all together to comfort each other in a group except for Thomas. Brothers and sisters, have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt that everybody else was all together getting their faith on, but you were missing? On the day when the Lord was giving out faith tickets, you missed your opportunity. On the day when faith and belief was being shared and confirmed, you weren't there. Have you felt like everybody else got the faith memo? Everybody else got the faith email? Everybody else got the calling post of where to be at the proper time on the proper day so that they could get their faith, but your phone was off, so you missed it. Just like Thomas, you weren't there. You look around and it appears everybody else believes more than you do. Everybody else is walking with Christ better than you are. Everybody else gets whatever Jesus is putting down except for you. And like Thomas, you asking the question, where was Thomas? Why wasn't he there with the rest of the disciples? This is an interesting question posed in the text. It's even further posed. One scholar said it like this. There wasn't so much going on in Jerusalem in that day that Thomas had other places to be. It's not like he had a movie theater he could go catch a movie. It's not like there were restaurants he could go get something to eat. It's not like there was a mall he could be shopping. Most malls are closed on Sunday evenings anyway. Where was Thomas? He was not there with the disciples to meet Jesus when Jesus showed himself after the resurrection. For the sole purpose of building their belief, for the sole purpose of building their trust, Jesus showed himself to his disciples, but Thomas wasn't there. Any reasonable person should read this text, and you ought to ask the question, the same question that I ought to ask. Why wasn't Thomas in the place where the Lord would be? We must pause, brothers and sisters, and we've got to ponder this question. How did Thomas miss this pivotal and important event? In a minute, when you keep reading, the Lord will make up for Thomas's absence. In a minute, the Lord will make accommodation for the fact that Thomas wasn't there. But the real question is, in the time when the Lord came the first time around, on the first go-round, why wasn't Thomas there? Well, I'll go before you and I'll tell you the Scripture never answers the question. Scripture never tells us where Thomas was or why Thomas wasn't there. Because the goal of the text is not to answer the question. The goal of the text is to ask question. So, as you listen to me preach this morning, why weren't you there to meet the Lord? Why weren't you there when the Lord was offering evidence and proof of his realness? Why why weren't you there when the Lord had a resurrection in your life and wanted to demonstrate to you that it came from the Lord your God? Where were you? You see, the text poses the question because the text wants you to ask the question in your own life, wants me to ask the question in my own life. Only I can answer the question of how did I miss it? What had my attention? What was occupying your mind? What were you believing in? What's dominating your time to cause you to miss the Lord? We just went through 46 days of Lent. Why weren't you there fasting with us? We have prayer meeting every Wednesday to petition before the Lord. Why weren't you there to pray with us? Say la midday prayers every day, Monday motivation every Monday morning, Bible study every Wednesday. Only you can answer the question if you dare to ask it. Will you dare this week after Easter, the same week after Easter that is in our text, to challenge yourself and ask yourself the question, why wasn't 
So the record states that after missing the Lord on Easter Sunday evening, I'm in verse 25, the other disciples told him, hey, Thomas, we, we have seen the Lord. You would think Thomas would be excited that somebody he trusted had seen the Lord. You would think Thomas would be overjoyed doing backflips that brothers he had walked with for three years had seen the Lord. But Thomas says back to them, I'm still in the 25th verse, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, unless I put my finger in the mark of the nails, unless my hand goes in his side, Thomas says, I will not believe. Brother, wait a minute. You had the audacious audacity to miss it, to not be there when the Lord came back. And now you're going to get indignant talking about, I'm not going to believe unless I can see for myself. Thomas said, you all were happy with just seeing him. This is him talking to his disciples. You all were happy with just seeing him. But Thomas said, listen, I'm not a civil trial. I'm a criminal case. I need a burden of proof that's just a little bit higher. I, I have to not only see him, but I have to touch him. Unless I see and touch, I will not believe. I can only imagine that Jesus Christ was on earth at this point before his ascension. He must have heard Thomas's words, though he was not in the room. His spirit is always there. He must have heard Thomas's words and said, how many times do I have to prove it? How many times do I have to show up in the lives of believers? How many times do I have to make a way out of no way? How many times do I have to bring them up and bring them out? How many times do I have to bring them through? How many resurrection Sunday mornings after Good Friday deaths do I have to have in their lives? And still you won't believe. Jesus probably said how many times, and he had only walked with Thomas for three years. Now, you are a little bit older than three, aren't you? So the Lord's been walking with you for longer than three years, a lot longer than he's been walking with Thomas. I'm 40. That means the Lord has been walking with me 13 times as long as he walked with Thomas, yet still I'm asking him to prove himself. Since the day of my birth, the Lord has shown up and shown out continuously. I can tell you story after story, testimony after testimony of the ways in which I have seen the miraculous occur in my life. How he's made the impossible possible. How he has made the rough places smooth. How he made the crooked places straight. And still, like Thomas, I have the audacity to tell the Lord, unless you do this, I will not believe. How many times? How many different ways does the Lord have to show up to activate our faith? How many times does the Lord have to do something to build your trust? How many times does the Lord have to demonstrate the Lord's truth? Well, the Bible says, it was a week later until Jesus came again. So stay with me. On Easter Sunday evening, Thomas missed the Lord, had a conversation with the disciples after the fact, and said, unless I get a chance to see him for myself and touch him, I won't believe. And you would think the Lord would have said, oops, miss one, ran right back to see Thomas. But the book says, a whole nother week passed. We went from the Sunday of Easter until the Sunday after Easter. It was the Sunday of Easter when Thomas said, mm-mm. Unless I see him or touch him, I won't believe. That was his spirit on the Sunday of Easter. He did not get a chance to see or touch the Lord on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday or Friday or Saturday. It wasn't until the next Sunday that he got a chance to see the Lord again. And so my question of the text is, what happened to Thomas during that week? I wonder what Thomas was processing in his mind. I wonder what was going through his heart. Was it the same doubt and unbelief that you and I tend to experience when the Lord delays in our life? Was it the same yearning for God and wishing that God would please show up and show out? Do for me, God, what you did for the other disciples. Show up for me, God, like you showed up for them. Show yourself to me, God, like you showed yourself to them. Is it, are we asking God to do for us what he did for other people? A week passed. Verse 26 says the disciples were again in the same house. Only difference is this time, Thomas wasn't going to miss it. Only this time, Thomas was with them. And when you read that particular detail in the text, it is at this point in the story you should be confused. Because I am. 
The Sunday of Easter, Thomas was indignant. Unless I see him for myself, unless I touch him for myself, I will not believe. A week has passed. A week later, he's in the house with the disciples. You should be confused. Well, you're sitting there saying, well, Reverend Williams, I don't understand. Why should I be confused? Well, let me tell you why you should be confused. A week ago, Thomas said, unless I see him or touch him, I will not believe. The Lord does not honor Thomas's request for a calendar week. Yet a week later, Thomas is still hanging out with the disciples. This ought to bother you. A week ago, you asked to see him or touch him. He didn't show up on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday. You and I don't get what we want. We walk away. You and I don't get what we want. We stop hanging out. You and I don't get what we want. We are not in the house with the disciples. But a week later, he still hasn't seen the Lord. A week later, his prayer has not been answered. A week later, his request has not been acquiesced to. Yet he's still with the disciples. Thomas did not get what he wanted, yet he's still coming to church. He's still streaming online. He's still involved in ministry. He's still praying for others. He's still going to Bible study. He is still there. Uh, Thomas did not get what he wanted, but he's still fasting for Lent. He's still calling your name before the Lord. He's still hanging out with the disciples. He's still there. Uh, his doubt did not disqualify him. His doubt uh, would not deny him. His doubt uh, did not dissuade him. One week later, he's still there. And you and I should be confused by this. Normally, when I don't get what I want, I fume, that's not for me, and I just walk away. I move on with my life. Normally, if I don't get what I want, I get frustrated with God, and I move on, and I do something else. Normally, if the Lord doesn't show out and show out in the way that I want him to, I move on with my life. But my brother Thomas, one week later, is still in the house with the disciples. He is waiting on the Lord with good cheer. And you ought to ask yourself, how is it possible that when I don't get what I want, I can still be walking with the Lord? How is it possible? When someone I did not want to die dies, I can still walk with the Lord. How is it possible? When I lose the job that I know I need, I can still walk with the Lord. How is it possible? When I don't get pregnant, when I want to get pregnant, I can still walk with the Lord. How is it possible? When the doctor tells me I've got cancer, I can still walk with the Lord. Thomas, how did you do it? How could you hang in there with the Lord when he didn't show up for a whole week, when he didn't do what you asked him to do, the way you asked him to do it? How can you hang in there with the Lord when it appears for a whole week you did not get the desire of your heart? How can you hang in there with the Lord when the Lord did not show up sooner than right now and quicker than yesterday? How did you do it? Well, the reason, brothers and sisters, is that doubt has to do with your mind. And faith has to do with your spirit. You see, I can doubt in my mind and believe in my heart all at the same time. Because, brothers and sisters, that is the process of being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Any Christian who tells you they have walked with the Lord in their heart but never had any doubts in their minds is a lie from the pit of you know where. All of us who walk with the Lord, all of us who trust the Lord our God, all of us who have given our lives over to God and said all to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. Every single one of us has faith in our hearts, but if we would be true, we still have doubts in our minds. There are many who doubt and come to church every Sunday. They doubt. Uh, but they serve in ministry. They doubt. Uh, but they sing in the choir. They doubt. Uh, but they have their babies read Easter speeches. They doubt. Uh, but they preach sermons every Sunday. They doubt and they doubt and they doubt. Uh, but doubting does not disqualify you from believing. Because even though one's mind isn't there to completely surrender all and yield to the process of giving our brains to Jesus, there's still a small voice in your spirit. You see, brothers and sisters, when I preach to you on Sunday morning, when the music ministry sings to you on Sunday morning, when one of our deacons prays to you on Wednesday night, we are not preaching or singing or praying to your mind. The mind is a feeble thing that is desperately wicked at some times. But we are preaching and singing and praying to your spirit. And the book says there's a still small voice in my spirit, a small voice in my spirit that says even though I have doubt, 
but uh, I've got to trust him. Even though my mind doesn't understand, I've got to trust him. In spite of my mind, I'm still going to church. In spite of my doubts, I'm still going to call his name. I, I may not think it will happen, but when I show up to church, uh, even with my doubts, uh, I am not here because I think I'm going to have an experience with the holy. Uh, I come to church uh, because I believe in my heart uh, that God is here. Uh, I come to church uh, because I believe in my heart that the Spirit will meet me here. Uh, and even though I may doubt sometimes, uh, isn't it good news that my mind uh, is not a requirement for my faith? Uh, isn't it good news uh, that he sent his Holy Spirit uh, to keep me even when I'm not smart enough to keep myself? I am here that I might decrease so that he might increase in me. And so there in a locked room, still with a band of buddies who were called his believers, Jesus came into his life. The book says, he says, peace be with you. And then he ignores the other ones in the room. He turns directly to Brother Thomas and he says, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and, and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And this is the second time in the text you ought to be irritated. You ought to be bothered because something confusing has occurred in the text. This is the second time when Jesus shows up, ignores everybody else in the room, and starts directly talking to Thomas. You and I ought to be bothered. And do you know why you ought to be bothered? Because the record states... That when Thomas told the disciples what he needed from Jesus to believe, uh, the record states that Jesus was not in the room. So how is it that Jesus, you're going to show up a week later and give me exactly what I need to believe when you were not in the room a week ago to hear what I believe? And the answer is because... Thomas never gave in to his doubt. Uh, but even in the midst of his doubt, he depended on his faith. Uh, brothers and sisters, I've come this morning to tell you that if you won't give in to your doubt, uh, it does not matter that you couldn't see him. It doesn't matter that you couldn't hear him. It doesn't matter that sometimes you can't feel him. The issue is not, can you see, hear, or feel God? Uh, the belief is that even in my doubts, God can see, hear, and feel me. Uh, Jesus was not in the room, uh, but if you read earlier, he he breathed his spirit on the other 11, uh, which means when Thomas was in that room telling them what he needed, uh, the spirit of God was there. Uh, and that's how God knew to give Thomas exactly what he needed, the way he needed it to go. Uh, so what I'm trying to tell you is that even in your worst doubtful moments, uh, even when you can't see how to make a way out of nowhere, uh, the Holy Spirit of God is there in the room. Uh, God knows exactly what you need. Uh, God knows exactly exactly how you need it. Uh, and if you would not give in to your doubts, uh, if you would not give in to the feeble nature of your mind, uh, if you would not listen to the people on Twitter, uh, but you would trust in the Lord at all times uh, and understand his praise uh, should continually be in your mouth, uh, then it is possible uh, even in the midst of doubt, uh, I can wait on him. Uh, even in the midst of doubt, uh, I can believe in him. Uh, even in the midst of doubt, uh, I can hold on. Uh, I've come to tell you this morning, it might be a week later. It might be a month later. It might be a year later. But just like Thomas, uh, if you would just have Hang in there. God will. I said God will show up in your life. And when Jesus shows up, he'll come with exactly what you need at the right time, on the right day, in the right moment, with the right words and the right spirit. You just, you got to hold on. Thomas. Thomas is so overcome with faith that a week after his request, God would hear his need and give him what he needed. That he shouts out loud, my Lord and my God, my master and my creator, my healer and my way maker, my alpha and my omega, my God 
It's all about you. I'm, I'm sticking with God because God remembered me. I'm walking with God because God thought about me. I'm trusting with God because God heard my every cry and pitied my every groan. And, and if the story stopped there, I would shout all by itself. Because what we've heard up to this point uh, is enough to make me run around the room. But you got to keep reading because in the 29th verse of the chapter, Jesus keeps on talking. Uh, because my Bible says that in any good story, uh, the Bible says Jesus reserves the right uh, to give you exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ask or even imagine. Uh, at this point, the meal is finished. You've got everything you need, but the 29th verse is the dessert. It is the cherry on top. It is the completion to the meal. The Lord says, Thomas, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me, yet still choose to believe. I know you're excited to have faith, he says. I, I know you're believing because I remembered you. I know you're in worship because I came to you. I know you're calling me my God and my Lord because I gave you what you needed. But, but I hope, Thomas, uh, that I'm not only getting this response from you because you got what you wanted. Because I told you a long time ago, baby, I'm going to give you more than what you want. I, I'm going to give you everything you need. Uh, so you know what that means? Uh, that means blessed are those who don't see. Blessed are those who don't get what they want. Blessed are those who never experience what they think they should have. Blessed are those who never get a chance to see it, uh, yet they still believe. Uh, because I can trust that God will show up. I can believe that God will. This, this is the difference between faith and knowledge. Thomas got all excited because he actually saw the Lord and he got to touch it. So that which was faith during the week that he waited was converted to knowledge because he got to actually bring it down to the earth in the five senses that he understood. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is saying to Thomas in this text, and I'm saying to you, if you have to wait to believe until the Lord brings it down to earth, you've just watered down your faith. But blessed are the ones who are willing to believe what eyes have not seen. Blessed are the ones who are willing to believe what ears have not heard. Blessed are the ones uh, who are willing to believe in the things hoped for, who are willing to trust in the evidence of things not seen. How many times? How many times do I have to prove it? Tell the Lord today, no more, Jesus. I can look back over my life and all that I've been through. That's enough evidence. I can look back over my life and I can remember specific spots and situations, specific circumstances. That's, that's enough evidence, Jesus. I trust you. My doubts may be there, but my faith will lead the way. God bless you, brother. There are some things I may not know There are some places I can't go But I 